you have a Bible with you, open it up with me to the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 4. The last Adam. I'm going to talk about that. So last week we saw at the end of chapter 3 that as Jesus was baptized in the Jordan there by John the Baptist, that he was anointed for his public ministry as the Holy Spirit descended upon him as a dove, hearing the voice of the Father from heaven, the Spirit descending upon him, there's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit of God. So when we talk about anointing, that's kind of a Bible word, that's kind of a church word, they have the anointing. <laughs> what does it mean? Jesus tells us what it means for him in Luke's gospel, uh, switching over to there. And, and this is Jesus when he was up in Nazareth where he had grown up after the temptations in the wilderness. And uh, he sits down in the synagogue in, in Nazareth and he begins to open the scroll and read from Isaiah. And then he says this. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's the anointing. And then he goes on to give some reasons that the spirit is upon him. He says, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, when we get to Matthew chapter 5, when we look at the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to look at what it is to be poor in spirit. Because very often what we do, if I hear that someone is poor, I think about financial terms. I think in terms of, well, they're poor. They, don't have, they can't pay their bills or whatever it is. They're homeless. But it goes way beyond that. When we look at the spiritual condition of man outside of Christ, we'll go there, not today. <laughs> he says, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And, and folks, there's a lot of that out there. Have you ever been or are you currently brokenhearted? To proclaim liberty to the captives. And I, again, when I think about somebody being captive, I think in terms of, well, maybe they're in jail or they're incarcerated or there's something like that. But truly, think about the ways in which human beings, men and women, are held captive. Perhaps it's drugs, alcohol, sex, relationships, even things like fame and so on. The list goes on. We're held captive to the philosophies of men. Jesus came that people could be liberated, to be set free from those things. He goes on, he says, in recovery of sight to the blind. Uh, and folks, understand the condition of man again. Yeah, he, is, he did do healing of blind people, people that were literally blind, physically blind. But think about the people that he came who were unable to see the kingdom of heaven, who were unable to see him as he is. He came to give sight to the people that couldn't see the kingdom. To set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So as we look at this, that is why Jesus was anointed there at the river by John. He tells us in Luke, what that anointing meant, what it amounted to, what he would be doing as a result of the Spirit coming upon him. Understand, too, as we get back into Matthew here, there are no chapter breaks. Matthew didn't, he didn't say, no, I'll, I'll do chapter four. <laughs> we put that in for our convenience, but uh, this is a continuing narrative as Matthew writes. So it goes right from Jesus' baptism into chapter four, Verse 1, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. <laughs> My notes here, I heard, bro, welcome to the ministry. <laughs> the Spirit was upon him to preach deliverance to the captives, yes. Good news to the poor, absolutely. Bind up the brokenhearted. However, before he does any of that, the first thing the Holy Spirit compels him to do 
to see is, is to go out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It's as though God says, I have some old business that I need to settle that needs to be tended to. And it has to do with the first Adam. Yeah, that guy, back in Genesis. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that there's a, a first Adam and a last Adam. And in these wilderness temptations, it's as though the Father's saying, before you begin your public ministry, I have a score that needs to be settled. And he does. Why? Because, folks, sin in God's economy is a pass-fail proposition. Now, remember, when you were in school, there were some classes you got, you get an A, B, C, D, F, hopefully not a lot of those. But then there were also classes, I remember when I was in Bible college, it was (laughs) pass-fail. They didn't do graduations of grades. They didn't do that. So understand, we look at sins, and and we sort of put them on a scale, degrees of severity of sin. I mean, you run a stoplight, or, you know, I look at some of these crazy dictators, especially in the last century, killed millions of people. There is a difference, and of course there is. But understand that from God's standpoint, sin is sin, and it's a pass-fail proposition. The first Adam. We look at him. We see that through his failure, that sin and death pass to the entire human race. Romans 6.23 tells us, looking at death, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. The wages of sin, what is a wage? It's something that one earns. So as we look at that, if I see that in God's economy, the only thing I can earn is death, We know that we're saved by grace through faith, not as a result of works, lest anybody should be able to boast. True. But what about sin? I want to take a moment, I want to look at a biblical definition of sin. So looking at this, the Apostle John, probably 50 or 60 years later than the events we're reading about here, he's an old man, somewhere between 90 and 100 years old, He's living in Ephesus, and he begins to write. And we see here uh, uh, in 1 John, in his first letter uh, that he wrote, he has this to say about sin. He says, do not love the world in verse 15, uh, 1 John 2. Hold on to that. He says, don't love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Folks, virtually every temptation, every sin that a man or a woman could commit over an entire lifetime will fall into one of these three categories. Every one. Every single one. Going all the way back to Genesis, in Genesis 3, we see the devil tempting Eve with his enticements. We see there that she saw that the tree was good for food. Ah, that looks good. I'm hungry. The lust of the flesh. She saw that it was pleasant to the eye. The lust of the eyes. She saw that it was desirable to make one wise. The pride of life. All three. So as we look at this and looking at how the enemy is enticing her and we look at the enemy coming to Jesus, there are only three places in all of God's word where Satan has a voice. Oh, he has a voice, but there are only three places where it's recorded for us. The first is here in Genesis 3, then in Job chapter 1, and then finally here in Matthew chapter 4. The only three places in all of the Bible. In Genesis, he is slandering God to man. Understand that. 
He says to Eve, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day of you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, Eve, and you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. Slandering uh, God to men. Slandering God to Eve. Essentially, he's saying he's holding out on you, Eve. There's more, but he's not letting you know. So Satan slanders God to Eve and tempts her to doubt. Folks, that is... That is one of the oldest <laughs> tricks of the book, is that, is that when the enemy comes in or when my flesh or the world, when, when those things come, when those things, temptations to drift, it's because I begin to doubt. Can, really, can God really come through in this thing that I'm dealing with? Is he going to show up with this heavy weight that I'm carrying? Is he going to prevail in this battle? So a sentence sets out, Satan sets out to deceive Eve. He turns it around. Notice that. He convinces her that God is the one that's doing the deceiving here. He's holding out on you, Eve. You need to do something about that. The second time we hear Satan's voice is in Job chapter 1. And there God tells him, have you cons- tell Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan's, oh yeah, I've considered him. He serves you. He, you've blessed him. This is a guy with all of the flocks and a bunch of children and wealth and all of that. You take that away from him, he's not going to worship you. He's not going to serve you. So you know the story. God takes Job down. He allows Satan to take Job down. Destroy his life. Yet, Job bears up holds himself close to God through it all. So in Genesis 3, Satan slanders God to man. In Job chapter 1, it is Satan slandering man to God. He won't do it. He won't hold up. The next time we hear his voice is here in Matthew chapter 4. But here, Satan has a problem. Here, the devil is facing the God-man. 100% God, 100% man in one person. And he proves his ineptness in dealing with him by the things that he puts forth. We'll see that as we go through the text. Verse 2, and when he, Jesus, had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. So Matthew brings out, he talks about Jesus. He's out here in this barren desert, the Judean wilderness. And Jesus' severe physical condition after this long, long fast. We understand that when hunger pains return after such a lengthy fast, organ failure and death are not far off because one's body is now beginning to consume itself. Jesus is dying at the end of this. The natural appetite that would be provided to the tempter here uh, would give him an advantage, which many people would would buckle under as he exploited them. Verse 3, Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you're the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Jesus' hunger was beyond any hunger that you or I will likely ever experience. I mean, unless you get stranded on a desert island somewhere or something like that. Because what he was experiencing was a deep, visceral need for nourishment. It wasn't merely the desire for a meal. And that's how the enemy tempts. That's how he works. He knows where Jesus' weakness is. He knows that he's hungry. He knows that he's tired. It's been nearly a month and a half since anything has crossed his lips. Where is your hunger? Because that's where the enemy comes to us. He will come to us with bread if that's our hunger. We'll talk about that more as we go. So when Satan comes to him and says, if you're the son of God, command that these stones become bread, he's not doubting who Jesus is. Understand that. He was likely there when the heavens were open. And he heard the voice of the Father 
as the Spirit came down saying, this is my beloved Son. No, he's not doubting who he is here. In a manner of speaking, what he's saying here is because you're the Son, is this the way that God treats you? Really, Jesus? He's doing the same thing that he tried on Eve. He's holding out on you. And and he uses the same lie on Jesus that he uses there, the lust of the flesh. It's in those times of waiting, as we wait for God to come through in some circumstances that we're dealing with, that we can begin to think that he's never going to provide. Remember, I went through a a particular trial that lasted six years. And I mean, I was bleeding out. It was tough. And I would call my pastor and talk with him about it. And he just kept telling me, John, Hebrews 10, 36, one of my life verses, you have need of patience that after having done the will of God to wait for what's been promised. Folks, that's hard. Bearing up under trial and bearing up under temptation is hard because our flesh doesn't like it. We want satisfaction. We want solution. We want everything to come to a culmination and be done with it. Often that's not the way that God works is he's allowing things in our lives for his purposes to be worked out. It's in those times of waiting that we see God come through that build our faith on the other side of it. So that's what Satan is trying to convince Jesus of here. He's saying, you're the son of God and you're hungry? This is going on? Well, since you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread, Jesus. I mean, I know you have the power to do it. Verse 4, but he answered and he said, it's written that men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Notice Jesus' reference to his humanity here. He says, man shall not live by bread alone. He's essentially saying, Satan, I don't have to be God's son to defeat you. And there's a lesson in this for us. I don't have to exercise my deity. I'll defeat you through being led of God's spirit and, and walking obediently according to God's word. Folks, if you want to see victory in your life, be led of God's spirit and walk in obedience to God's word. That's our great example. That's what he's doing here. The point here is that God's power is not shown in our lives by knowing the scripture. As good as that is, God's power is seen in our lives by us obeying the scripture. Because Jesus says, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I want to take a look here, and, and I want to examine something here. He, usually when we see the word, word, we look at it as logos. That's the Greek word for the written word of God. That's not the word that Jesus uses here. He uses the word rhema. That's R-H-E-M-A, not logos. And what that means is utterance. So when we look at Scripture... We use that. It's when the written word becomes the spoken word. And and let me give you an example. I I was sharing with a brother the other day uh, about a time years ago. Stacy was very, very sick. She was dying. She was in surgery. Uh, I was in the parking lot of a hospital, and I was wrestling. It had only been a year since my own daughter had gone to heaven and I was just crying out to God, sitting there in my car in the parking lot. She's, I don't know if she's going to live or die, truly. And, and, and saying, God, I can't do this again. I, can't, I just can't go through this. This is hard. And, and my heart was definitely not at peace. In that moment, a passage of Scripture came into my mind, into my, my heart, from Philippians chapter 4 about having the peace that passes understanding. Know it well. Taught, the bur- taught, that, taught that book <laughs> a couple of times and all. And yet, I had never been in a place where it came to bear in my life the way that it did that day. So as God spoke that word to my heart, 
He showed me that I was asking for peace according to my understanding and according to my circumstances. She might die. I don't know what's going on. I can't do this. I'm an emotional mess, Lord. I can't do this. And he said, you're asking me for peace according to your understanding. And it's not going to be found there, John, because if you ask me for peace that way, all you're going to do is argue with me. It's true. Yeah, but. Yeah, but Lord, she's in bad shape. Yeah, but. What the Lord spoke to me in that moment is just receive my peace. Just receive it. Don't don't argue with me about it. Don't rationalize it. Don't go to your circumstances. Don't go to the events of the day. Don't go to any of that. Just receive my peace. I did. My heart was changed in that moment. I got out of my car. Circumstances hadn't changed a bit. But I was changed. Just receive my peace, John. And there are times where I wrestle that out, like you. That's rhema. That's what it is when the written word becomes the spoken word and God speaks a passage to my heart. That's what it is when I read my Bible and something leaps off the page. And, and you know, my, my mind is in that place of saying, ah, yes, this is for me. It's the Holy Spirit taking the word of God, driving it into the heart of the man or the woman of God, by the Spirit of God. We all go through times. If you know the Lord Jesus, then you know that sense when when you're going along and some verse pops into your mind and you think, wow, that really applies. That's Rhema. It's how God speaks. We call it the living word. Now, it doesn't go in reverse. I want to caution you on that. You know, when people come up to me and they say, thus saith the Lord, and it's some goofy thing that's not in God's word, or it's the opposite, it doesn't, no, it, we don't speak God's word into his, we don't, we speak from his word. That's why the psalmist says, in Psalm chapter one, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It's about hiding it because it's not going to come out if it's not going in, folks. That's why if you're here, you're part of a, a church that wants to teach God's word, verse by verse. It's to get that word into us so that it can be expressed in our lives as we deal with and we grapple with different situations and circumstances that come along. That's God's design. So here, uh, well, I go to verse 5 here before I go any further on that. Uh, He says in verse 5 that the devil then took him up to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you're the son of God, throw yourself down. For it's written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. So here the the devil now, he quotes Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12, but he takes it out of context. He's saying, go ahead, Jesus, if you do this, the Bible promises that angels will rescue you. Yeah, you're good. Go ahead, jump off. This is a temptation that would be putting God to a spectacular test. But folks, there's a principle in this for you and I as well. It is always, and I will underscore always, a bad idea to put God to the test, to ask God to prove himself. It's his ball and it's his ball game and he makes the rules and we live by them. We don't make them up and then have him jump to our whole thing. Testing God. It doesn't equate. It's not the same as trusting God. He calls us to trust, not to test. So had Jesus gone up and and gone to the pinnacle of the temple, which would be the corner of the temple that would overlook the Kidron Valley, if he had gone up and he had jumped the hundreds of feet down from the pinnacle of that temple into the Kidron Valley... So the angels would swoop down and catch him. Essentially, he would have been, uh, it would have been a massive presumption uh, against God's will for him as the Messiah. Presuming upon God, the Father's will for the Son. It was for him to fulfill all righteousness. We looked at that. In that, 
That included that the, he would go on, he would live out his life and, and, and the functions of Messiah on earth, and then that would lead to him suffering, dying, rising from the dead, and then ascending to the Father. So Satan, in this temptation, now questions the Father's protection for him. Do you believe your Father will really protect you, Jesus? Do you? Prove it. Prove it to yourself. Prove it to me. Prove it to Israel. You can do this. You have the power. Go to the pinnacle of the temple. Throw yourself off. Doesn't Psalm 91 declare that God will give you his angels, give them charge over you, and keep you from even stubbing your toe? I mean, Bible words, yeah, you strike your foot against the stone. He's talking about stubbing your toe. So Satan quotes scripture, and he does. He's good at it. But he stops short of the true context in this passage in the process. Psalm 91.11 actually says, for he shall give his angels charge over you. And the end of that verse is, to keep you in all your ways. In all God's ways. Jesus knew this. And he answers Satan accordingly. Verse 70, Jesus said to him, it is written again that you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So notice that Jesus answers Satan by, again, refers to God's word in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 6. Literally, he says, what that verse says is you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. What he's talking about is Israel. In their history, in Exodus 17, they were at a place called Massa. The Jews had put God to the test there, and there had been disastrous results. Don't have time to go into it. The point in this is putting God to the test is to distrust him. It, it's the sin of presumption. And folks, to presume upon God is a very unhealthy thing to do. Let me give you an example. Back from my Bible college days, I, I, we had wrapped up one of the semesters uh, at school, and one of my... Uh, acquaintances, a guy by the name of Joe, he, he shows up and he says, I'm headed for Vegas. And I, I thought, I said, what? What are you doing, Joe? He said, well, I don't have enough money for the next semester, and so I'm just going to go all in. And I said, that's kind of presumptuous, Joe. And he said, nope, I'm going to Vegas. Figured, you know what? If God wants me to go, then I'm going to go, and I'm going to just clean up. I'm going to win. And I told him, you are presuming upon God. Not a good idea. Came back and packed his bags and went home. But, and that's a big example. It's just kind of a goofy one. It's the one that comes to my mind when I think about presuming upon God. It's like, oh my goodness, what do you you mean you're going to Vegas? But we can, in subtle ways, ourselves presume upon him. We can hold an attitude of obligating him to act or, or, or... to, to do something in a certain way in a given circumstance or situation. You've got to remember, God is God. As I mentioned, it's his ball, it's his ball game. He makes the rules, and we get to play. To do anything but is to presume upon him. He does obligate himself, for instance, to hear our prayers. And something, again, a good example of the people in the world You know, it's like, I'll reject God, reject God, reject God, reject God, but then something happens and my life gets into trouble and I'm going through some heavy thing. Well, would you pray for me? And I'm like, well, the prayer that God wants to hear from you at that moment is a prayer of repentance, that you would give your life to Christ, turn from all the garbage that you're engaged in. Very presumptuous to think, well, now I'm going to pray and cry out to God in the middle of this circumstance without having done business with him through the cross. Presumptuous. And I understand the natural man thinks that way, and I'm not, you, know, you don't try to clean the fish before you catch them. You know, that's, that, I understand that. But again, it's just an example of how we can presume upon God. We can actually try to box him in with our ideas. Not a good idea. Verse 8 again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain, 
and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you'll fall down, prostrate yourself, is what that literally says, and worship me. Now, Luke gives us a little more detail on this. And Luke's gospel tells us in Luke chapter 4, in verse 6, it says, And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give to you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. You can have it all, Jesus. That would be the temptation. But essentially what Satan is telling him is if you bow down and worship me, you can bypass the cross. You can go right past all of that stuff, all of that pain, all of that heartache, all of that grief and wearing the sins of humanity. He says, I'll give you a possession of the kingdoms of the world now. When he says everything you see is mine and whoever I give it to them, uh, I'll give them, Jesus doesn't argue with him about that because he knows that this is essentially a counterfeit offer. (coughs) He knows that one day Satan will hand over the kingdoms of the world. But he won't be handing it over to Christ. They'll be handing it over to none other than the Antichrist himself at the end of the age. Yet in that day, as we see in Revelation chapter 5, a beautiful imagery there, shocking imagery, that John is weeping because no one is found worthy to take the scroll. That scroll is the title deed to the earth. He says, and then one stepped up as a lamb with the marks of slaughter on his body steps up to take the title deed to the earth back. The first Adam surrendered that deed in the garden. The last Adam reclaims it. And I can't wait. He he won the right at the cross to take that title deed back. I look at the earth as being in escrow right now. He's already taken it. He's already won the right to take it back because he fixed everything that Adam blew but he's waiting. And in his own divine providence and in ways, some ways that we don't understand, some we do, he's waiting. And he will, but he will take that back. He has the right. Remember also that the world in its present state is passing away. That's what John said, first John. Look around. This thing is coming apart. It's not going back together. It's not getting better. It's not the paradise that was created to be, that's for sure. Remember, Adam was given dominion. He had control of it all. And he surrendered it. And the earth at that point was subjected, as we're told in Rome, was subjected to futility. So, Lucifer shows him all the kingdoms of the world. What he's offering him is power. But Jesus isn't tempted by that. You gotta understand. Remember, he already has the power, but he's ret- and, and he's restraining because there's work to do in the meantime, the redemption of humanity uh, before he comes a second time and takes it all back. Verse ten. Then Jesus said to him, "Away with you, Satan! For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve." So once again, Jesus quotes and applies the scripture here in Deuteronomy 6 again. Uh, Notice as Jesus commands Satan to go, what does Satan do? He goes. It's interesting, uh, too, that Satan didn't, he didn't say anything about Jesus serving him. Conspicuous in its omission. He says, worship me. But folks, you got to understand that that which a man or a woman worships, that they will serve. What If you worship money, you will serve money. If you worship, fill in the blank, that's what you will serve. And so folks, there's a great principle in this for us. Again, 
Be careful who you or who or what you worship because you will become subservient to that thing. So Jesus led into the wilderness not only to reveal to us who he is, but also to relate to humanity so that we could he could relate to us and we can relate to him as a man. The book of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17, we read, Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation, which means to carry the wrath of God, the penalty for sins, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Going to Hebrews chapter 4, 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. The God-man. Holy man, fully able to comprehend temptation. Holy God, not sinning in the midst of it. Verse 11, then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. So Satan is the, the, he's subject to God, and, and in James 4, we're told that if we resist the devil, what? He has to flee. He has to leave. And and folks, that's great instruction for us. So when we look at this, so what is temptation? I mean, I know know what it feels like to be tempted, and I I get kind of nebulous with talking about feelings, but I know it's that just that enticement. Webster's 1828 Dictionary. If you don't, it's online, it's free. I have it as one of the tabs in my computer browser because Noah Webster was a godly man. And before modern people took over the dictionary, there was great spiritual insight in that dictionary. So I looked up temptation in Webster's 1828. This is what Webster had, Noah Webster had to say. This is it's a solicitation of the passions. Enticements to evil proceeding from the prospect of pleasure or advantage. Isn't that good? I mean, there's no commentary required on that. I'll read it again. Temptation is a solicitation of the passions, enticements to evil proceeding from the prospect of pleasure or advantage. So understand too, for Jesus, there's no solicitation to evil as the enemy tries to get him to do something outside of the will of God. Got to understand that. He does not have that thief residing within. He does not have that traitor. He doesn't have Adam's nature. There's no sin nature living in him. However, he understands what it is to be tempted. He understands temptation when it comes. He understands what it is when you or I are tempted and we struggle because we all do. Therefore, in light of that, these I'll tell you what, these are really important things for us to understand and to apply to our own lives. Understand the nature of temptation. It's part of the nature of that first Adam. It's part of what Jesus came And as long as we're in this flesh, as long as we're in this body, uh, we're going to deal with it. So he comes to Jesus with the lust of the flesh. Turn these stones into bread. The lust of the eyes as he shows them the kingdoms of the world. The pride of life. Cast yourself down. And the angels will bear you up. That's how he destroys lives. Passions. Possessions. Position. He comes to us where we're hungry. He comes to us where we're weak. I often have said, he will hit you on your bruises. He doesn't hit me where I'm strong. He hits me where I'm already wrestling. Understand that. He's very deceptive. So, as we see him using these three tools to try to bring down the Son of God, 
understand that these are the three most effective weapons, temptations that he has. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. He understands the nature of man. He understands you well. But here he faces the God-man and Jesus subjects himself, led by the Spirit, to this period of fasting and temptation. Why? Because as I said earlier, it's a pass-fail proposition. The first Adam failed. The last Adam did not. He prevailed. Now, Romans chapter 5 tells us a little bit about this, the first and last Adams here. In Romans 5, 17, we read, for if by one man's offense, Adam, the first Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ, the last Adam. Therefore, as through one man's offense, first Adam, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, going to that cross, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. First Adam, last Adam. So in looking at this, we see the first Adam, look at some contrast here. He was in a beautiful garden, wasn't he? The last Adam was in a a barren, desolate, forsaken desert. The first Adam ate freely of things. Take anything you want in the garden except for one. Stay away from that piece of fruit. The last Adam ate nothing for 40 days and 40 nights. The first Adam was physically strong. The last Adam was on the verge of death. The first Adam gave, he gave in to the temptation of Satan, thereby plunged all of humanity into a lost and hopeless condition. The last Adam Jesus, our hero, he came through. And as he did so, he reveals to us who he is, the one who would go on to triumph over sin. The temptations of Christ. Very, very important that we see what God is doing through these things. Really kind of lays out a bit of a roadmap for the life ahead, the three years of ministry which would follow as Jesus would take on the things that he did. So as we wrap up, by way of application, I want to I look at some things here. And the first is this. Keep short accounts. Remember, Satan, he's not omnipresent. What that means is he's not everywhere at once. God is the only one who is omnipresent. He, he is everywhere at once. But Satan can't be everywhere at one time. So we see in verse 3 here that he shows up, that he comes to Jesus. In verse 11, it tells us that he goes, that he leaves. It's important for us to realize because, folks, often people blame all kinds of things on the devil. And I want to acknowledge right up front, there, yes, there is spiritual warfare. Yes, there are legions of demons. There, there are powers and principalities and heavenly rulers and, of darkness and all of that. And, 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 and I believe that there is personal attack that comes. I'm not negating that for a moment. But I am saying that people sometimes tend to blame everything on the devil when he's not around. It's important to understand that temptation comes to us in three ways. It comes through the world. We live in a fallen world. We live on a fallen chunk of rock. And there is lots out there to tempt you. I'll tell you what, I can barely, we don't even watch most of what is put forth as entertainment on television anymore because the world is just pumping this stuff at you all the time. And you see it. It's there. 
So temptation comes from the world, it comes from the flesh. That's that nature of Adam. It's that old man, that's that, that traitor that I talked about that resides in my heart. I'm tempted, tempted because those enticements come. And yet I have the Spirit of God within saying, John, don't engage. John, turn away from that. John, you blew it. You need to get right, and you need to walk right with me. That's the, that, it's the world, it's the flesh, and yeah, it's the devil. Those three things, we do battle with all of them. But the scripture declares, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You have living in you, if you know Christ, you have the keys to victory already. Use them. We saw in 1 John that we're not to love the world. And folks, if we live according to the nature of the first Adam, it's to live a life in the flesh. And the Bible tells us plainly that in that place, in that state, it is impossible to please God. It's to live a life outside of the will of God. It's to live a life that mocks the work of the cross. So for a believer, living in this manner is to invite chastisement, sometimes severe chastisement. For an unbeliever, living in this manner, that's to invite divine judgment, is to blow right past the work of the cross, to right past the work of redemption, which is offered to each one. Understand these are sobering truths. Keep short accounts. Keep short accounts with one another. Keep short accounts with God. The second thing that I want to look at as we wrap up is what are you hungry for? So when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, after that he was hungry. What's your hunger? Is it for money? Then Satan knows what he can put before you, doesn't he? Is it for position, power? And he knows what to put in front of you. Are you hungering for a husband or a wife or for a relationship? Well, then he knows how to come to you, doesn't he? He's going to tempt you where you're hungry. He will come to us and tempt us in our weakness. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The Apostle Paul writes, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. This is one of the most misinterpreted passages in all of the Bible. People like to say, well, God will never give you more than you can handle. That is hog wash. <laughs> he regularly gives us more than we can handle because he wants to drive us to further reliance upon him. In temptation, he will not give you more than you can handle because he will give you a way of escape. Very often, it'll be through that rhema that I'm talking about. I know that this is wrong and the Spirit of God is in me going, John, that's sin. Don't do it. Don't engage. I blow past that. I'm headed for trouble. That's what he's doing in us. Allow him to have his way as you wrestle things out in your life. And I don't know what you wrestle with. I know what I wrestle with. Let him have his way. Lives are destroyed by what God's word describes as unbridled lust. A lust is an inordinate desire. All right? So put a bridle on that thing. Because if you don't, you could fall. As we yield to passions, possessions, or position, those are the things. That I call, you know, I spent many years in the advertising business, and I know what a limited time offer is. As we read with Noah Webster, he said, you know, that's an enticement to pleasure or position, power, passion, to satisfy something in me. That's a limited time offer. Understand that. 
Be careful. Finally, by his spirit, through his word. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. What on earth was he saying? My sheep hear my voice. We're talking about it this morning. Allow God to speak his word to you. Is it personal? Yeah, it's personal. Are you wrestling this morning? Let him speak peace to your heart. I, I, I will never forget that moment in my car where I had absolutely no reason to have peace, and yet I got out of my car a changed person by the grace of God. Are you dealing with an area of temptation? Even an area of sin? Let him speak repentance, restoration in you. Are you depressed? Are you anxious? Let him speak comfort. Let him speak rest for you. The point is, his living word, his word is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, we're told in Hebrews chapter 4. As we apply his word to our lives, we understand that the mechanism, part of the mechanism is we, as we put this word into our hearts, he is faithful to bring it out by his spirit, through his word. Spend time in his word. Get that word of God into you so that in that time, in that moment, in that circumstance, in that instance, he can speak it back to you, bring it to you, the forefront, and then you have something through which you can hang on to and say, Lord, I know the right thing to do, the right way to go, the right way to respond in a given situation. And what we call that, folks, is growth. It's how we grow. It's how we grow in the grace and the knowledge of him. Let's pray. Father, as we consider these temptations that Jesus endured that he went through, seeing, Lord, that a very short time after the creation, everything went so terribly wrong with that first Adam. And that Jesus, as the last Adam, coming to set everything straight, to set it all back, the way that you designed for things to be, and one day, seeing that he will indeed renew the earth as well, what an encouragement. What a tremendous encouragement to us as we wrestle out the things in this life, as we face circumstances, as we deal with broken relationships, as we deal with sin in our lives, as we deal with heartache and grief and all of the rest. Lord, we're grateful that by your Spirit, through your Word, you come to us, you speak into us life, words of life, words of encouragement, words of hope. We pray, Father, that as we leave here today, as we get ready for the potluck and all, that you would just continue that work in us by your Spirit or through your Word. Encourage us. Bring us into a, just a wonderful place of fellowship with you. We thank you for all of this, Father. We thank you for your divinely inspired Word. And just thank you, Lord, for this morning. We give ourselves afresh to you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.